Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, come, come back. This is kind of a tale off of a, a message we did two weeks ago uh, out of Philippians talking about our mind. And we talked about basically the old computer adage, garbage in, garbage out. And today we want to say that as a church, as a body of believers, we need to be different. Uh, they call us to come out and be separate from the world, says the Lord. He wants us to be holy as He is holy. He wants us to be set apart. I was sent a video clip yesterday of a uh, pastor, I say John MacArthur, was being interviewed uh, by a news analyst. And the one thing that stuck out in the interview, uh, a lot of things was said, and he took an opportunity to uh, talk about the gospel. The one thing that was said was, I've watched you for many years. I've listened to many of your sermons. This is by a, a newscaster that wasn't an uh, evangelical believer. And uh, she said, I've listened to you for many years. And she says, our church is not taking a stand. But what I see in you is a difference. We see a difference in, in, in you is that you're willing to take a stand for Christ. And he said, you know, besides Christ, my, my favorite... Uh, a uh, person to follow in the Bible was Paul. And where did Paul spend a lot of his time? He said, he, he, here's his words, MacArthur's words were, Paul didn't go into town and ask what the hotel was like. Paul went into town and asked what the prisons were like because he knew he'd spend more nights in the prison than he would in the hotel. So we're going to look at a different, why believers should be different than the world. Often, well, we said the other week, often many times, there's not much difference. We, we look the same. We dress the same. We do the same entertainment. Uh, we uh, just uh, copy the world. But here in Ephesus, the background of the church at Ephesus is this, this was a church that had the gospel was preached and these lives were changed. But what Paul is addressing here was going backwards, going back to the old lifestyle. Now, you got to think of uh, the picture of Ephesus. It was a uh, leading commercial city of their day. And what happens when you have a big city, a commercial city, is a lot of uh, people come and gather together. you got an influx of, of people, and there was a, uh, a lot of cultural things going on in the city. It was uh, one of the leading cities of the Roman Empire. It also was a leading city of immorality. It, as it grew and it expanded, and people coming in to do business, it also succeeded as one of the largest cities of immorality. The temple of Artis, or Diana, was in Ephesus. That is a, that located in that city where thousands of temple prostitutes were there, and they promoted the worship of Diana. Now that's the background, that's the church background of these believers. So they came out of this background of worshiping uh, in this culture. You have sin just saturating uh, the culture, the entertainment, and all these things that are going on. I, I don't know about you, but the more that I'm reading my Bible these days, the more I see our culture in the Bible, the more I see the, 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 our country, the more I see people around us there. So here's the, the background, and the good news is they were saved out of that culture. They were worshiping this false god. They were in more in morality and and you know what flesh likes sin so they were there but inside of them they knew it was wrong and here comes paul preaching the gospel and their lives were changed now the warning comes up in ephesians uh, chapter 4 is that we must be different why believers must be different let's look at ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 and following so here the first three chapters are dealing with doctrinal. Now we're getting practical. We looked at the first portion of chapter 4 in Sunday school. In verse 17, he says uh, this, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. He's saying not walking as the other Gentiles. He's not just specifically saying that group of people, but he's calling the Gentiles as the, the unsaved, the people that were not resp responding to the gospel. He said, I don't want you to walk as the others Gentiles walked, in vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past, 
feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to the work of uncleanness with greediness. So he's saying, here's their past and, and what had they had given their life to. Verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that you have heard of him and have been taught by him and this as the truth in Jesus. So he's saying you are not like that. You have been transformed. Verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, your former life, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one to another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the uh, life of Paul, Lord, the transformation that you made in, in his life and his heart, Lord, for the people, for your people that you called out from this sinful uh, society, Lord, and you made a group of people. You developed a church there in that darkness. And Lord, we pray that we're able to apply this into our heart and our lives today, for it's in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. So he said in verse 17, that he testified the Lord, henceforth you walk not as other Gentiles. He says not, you need to be different. You need to be different because God commands it. God commands us to come out and be different. It goes back all the way to Leviticus, all the way back to the children of Israel when he calls them out. If you flip back to the beginning of your Bible, all the way back to uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18, just a couple verses I want to share with you there. He said to Moses, given the instructions, uh, verse 2, he said, Speak unto your children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where, where I bring you, you shall not do neither. Shall ye walk in their ordinance? Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk there, and I am the Lord your God. He says, while you're in Egypt, don't do as the Egyptians do. And when you get to Canaan, and I send you to Canaan, don't do what they're doing. He says, I want you to follow after me. That was God's order to say, follow after me. You are called out. You are called out to, to me and follow after me. And we've seen the, the history of the children of Israel. They would serve God, they would follow after God, and they'd fall away. And God would pass judgment upon them. They'd come back. We just looked at Ezra, the brokenness of Ezra for, for his country, for the people that they had intermarried and, and he crying, him crying out to, to the Lord. So here we have Paul saying the same thing as, hey, we need to be different. He says God commands it. He says not to be as the Gentiles. Don't go back to your old ways. Leviticus 19, he says, be holy because I am holy, because I'm a holy God. We sang that this morning. We sang that over and over. Holy, holy, holy. Can you imagine the throne room of heaven? That's the language of the angels. That, that's what you're hearing around the throne of God when Jesus is sitting on the throne. You hear him crying out, holy, holy, holy. As I, Isaiah saw uh, the Lord high and lifted up, the angels were crying, holy, holy, holy. Did he sit there and he celebrate? We have Christian songs talk about, man, when I see Jesus and I'm going to do this and I want to see Moses and this. I, I, that's great. And I, I could imagine that. But the centerpiece of our thought is going to be worshiping the King of Kings. Our salvation is fully going to be understood when we're in the throne room and we're at, bowing at his feet and realize that he saved me. I, I, I was a sinful uh, human being that didn't care for God, and He saved me, and He gave me this. The alternative was hell, and that's what we deserve, but by His grace, He gave us eternity. So He said He commands it. He don't want you to go back to the way the pagans were living. Uh, they had many gods. They were known for their, uh, their ways. They, they, they had many gods and many things that they, they fell into in the sins. God wanted them to be different. So much so that he gave them 600 laws to be different than the pagan world. You know what he's given to you as a believer? He's given us the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. 
We, we don't need to the, all the rules. We just have God's Word and the Holy Spirit leading us into righteousness, leading us into the, the right direction. We all, have, um, we all have struggles. We all have the flesh that we deal with. But we see that uh, he's telling us, these Ephesians, don't go back to the way you were. Paul said to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen to what Paul says. We'll go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Flip with me if you go back in your Bibles, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll go hit a few of these verses because I want you to see that it's an over-repeating uh, theme throughout Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. He says, Know ye not, your unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or effinite, nor abusers or them, of themselves or mankind, nor thieves or covetous, nor drunkards or rivalers, nor exhorters, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Put your name in that list somewhere we f- fall short. He says, some were, so were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. You are justified in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He said, hey, you are different. You are sanctified. You have been washed. Your sins have been forgiven. In Revelation, he talks about uh, a play. He talks about sending the unbelievers, the liars, and all those to a place called hell. He said that is the second death. But because of what Jesus Christ has done, he has given us eternal life. He's saying, think about, you fit into this category. This was you in the past. He says, but now you've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. He said, come out. Be different. Not just for yourself. The world needs to see that we are different. For the sake of the gospel, God wants us to be ambassadors for Him. He wants us to be lights that shine bright for Him. Is our life different from the world? Do we do things differently than the world does? It? Do we take in different information? Are we saturating ourselves with good things? Are we allowing good things in so good things would come out? So the second thing, not only says that God commands it, we have to be different because the world is rebelling against God. The world is rebelling against God. He says, not as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. This list, verses 17 through 19, is similar to Romans chapter 1, where, where he's talking about the gospel, and they said they rejected the, the gospel, and then God gave them up. They hardened their hearts to the truth of God, and they just went their own way. God continued to share their love and continued to try to show them that there's a better way, that there's forgiveness. And they were so saturated with their sin that they kept on going that direction. Here in verse 17, he says, Don't walk as the Gentiles in the vanity of their mind. The vanity of their mind. Paul describes the world's rebellion against God with this. Vanity means waste or emptiness. The problem with the world is, they got the wrong thinking. They got the wrong worldview. When, when the world is thinking, hey, life revolves around me. Life is about what I want. Life is about my pleasure. Life is about what, what I can get for, from life. You know what? The wrong thinking affects everything. It affects your view of life. We see it when people talk, and, and, and uh, in the political year, you see how people talk. You know what? That's their life. No, God is the giver of life. God giveth and God takes away. It's how people view death. Hey, the world views death as, you know what? I'm just passing on. No, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. The Word of God tells us there's, there's heaven or there's hell. There's one or the other. But our, our view, if we get the wrong thinking, we get saturated with, with this crowd here, the vanity, the emptiness, success. The world's thinking is success. Man, I, I've, got to, I, I've got to succeed. I've got to, I've got to make my first million. I've got to do this. I remember a couple years ago, met a guy, and he said that was his drive in life. And, and he was in New York City, and he said, my drive was to make my first million dollars. He said, you know what? I made it, and it was nothing. It was emptiness. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. He looks at life, and he said, life under the sun is just vanity. It's all empty. 
The problem is we don't need to be looking at life under the sun. We need to be looking over the sun. We got to be looking not just at these days. I like um, Francis Chan uh, illustrates that when he pulls out that long piece of rope and he puts a red dot on it and he says, you know, this is eternity as far as the rope can go. And he said, this is your life. That little speck of red dot on this big long rope, it's but a vapor. If you live to 100 years, it's but a, a vapor. But we think and we put everything into the here and now, just like the world. Marriage is viewed the same way as the world. Our money is viewed in the way of the world. Solomon described it as all. He tried everything, money, knowledge, women, pleasure, and everything was emptiness. Look at our society around us. Does vanity, does that... Uh, sum up our society around us? They, they're living for vain things. They're living for things that just leave them empty. And the thing is, we've got the answer. You don't have to keep going after the things that give you emptiness, the things that don't satisfy. And as Paul was trying to get them to remember, hey, Christians, remember, your life was full of emptiness. Your goals were just worldly goals. Your language is just worldly. Your pleasure was all worldly. You were looking at life under the sun instead of looking towards eternity. The world tries to find success and happiness and, and everything uh, and pleasure and everything in themselves. And it leaves them empty. We need to think differently than the world. We need to think uh, what honors God. What does God think about our success? What does God think about our path? What does God think about our money? What does God think about our marriage? What does God think is my purpose? We shared that in Sunday school. We say every believer has been given a gift. And you have a purpose, a part of the body of Christ. God just didn't leave you here to, to do nothing. Jen and I met with a, a lady this week. And, and, and her prayer is, you know, if the Lord is done with me, that he take me home. And, and I get that. I, I know when you're sitting there and, and you're dealing with pain and, and sickness and all that, but you got to remind it, if, be reminded, if God was done with you, He would take you home. He's the one that takes, gives us breath. He's the one that gives us another day. So if you're here, God is not done with you. It's as easy as that. So we look at it, not through the world, but through the godly lens that God has a plan and a purpose for my life. The world looks through the process of vanity. And he's just, and it's just grasping at air. And believers look at the, the process of vanity praising and worshiping God with their life. The second thing, the world is uh, darkened from their understanding. Verse 18. So he said, vanity. The second thing, having their understanding darkened. Having their understanding darkened. He's referring to their knowledge of God and the things of God. We see that throughout Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Man without the Spirit of God does not accept the things of God. When you were a part of the world, you thought as a world. You, you didn't think about spiritual things. And Paul said it as he writes. He said, you know what? When I was of the world, I thought like the world. And, and I didn't give care to the spiritual things. And, and that's the foolishness. And that's what Paul's trying to say. Don't go backwards. Remember the folly. Remember the vanity. Remember the darkness that was in their thinking there. The man without God's spirit looks at the world created in seven days as just foolishness. Have you ever talked to somebody and said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and He created it, and in seven days, on the seventh day, He rested. And they just look at you and say, that's laughable. Well, that's man without God. That's man looking at it in their vanity, their foolish thinking. A life dependent upon the Word of God. They say, oh, that's, that's just your crutch. No, it's our life. It's, it's a, the acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. It, it's our life book, the Word of God. <clears throat> a God who became man dies for the sins of world. It's, it's dies for all sin. That's beyond human uh, understanding. That a man would take on the punishment for another person. That didn't deserve it that didn't even care that you were taking their punishment. You know, that be, uh, you go down and tell a prisoner down at the, the prison that, you know what, I'm going to serve your punishment. You're on death row, I'm going to be put to death for you. And he'd not even care. He don't care, know who you are. 
And that's what God did for us before we even knew him, before we knew who he was. He loved you enough that he laid down his life for you. And the world looks at that and says, man, that's foolish. No, that's the greatest news I ever heard is that I, I don't have to, to, to pay for my own sins. I don't have to do sacrifices. I don't have to do the things anymore that they used to have to do, that Jesus did it for us. He says the darkness. So to the, to the world, the, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness. In Romans chapter 1, he says, professing to be wise, they became fools. They worshiped the created instead of the creator. Look at our society around us. They're, they're following after science. They're, and, and they haven't realized that they change their mind every five years. You know, five years ago, eggs were bad for you. Now you got to eat an egg a day. And they, they keep changing, change, changing their mind on everything. You know what? The Word of God is forever settled in heaven. It hasn't changed. You know, if you're going to put your faith in something, it wouldn't be a textbook or something that somebody writes and send and somebody else rewrites. How about the Word of God that's been sealed forever? And he tells us that how we can have eternal life. He tells us how we can live. You know what? The Word of God has the answer how we can get rid of sexual tra tra transmitted diseases, how we can get rid of uh, all these other things in our society. Why? Live by the, rules, uh, the Word of God and let the Word of God lead us uh, and direct us. So we see that uh, they call the, the uh, good bad and, and bad good. We see that in our, our life today. So some say that Paul calls the darkened uh, their understanding uh, as not being any different to, than today. We obtain degree after degree, access unlimited information on the internet, but our world is still without true understanding because they reject God. The author says, you know, we have more access to information and, and everything at, at our fingertips, but yet the world lacks understanding because they reject God. The basic uh, principle of their, their conscience is darkened because they reject the, the truth of the Word of God. The third thing here, the world is separated from God. He says, continue in verse 18, he says, their, their understanding is dark, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of that is in them. He says, Paul says, alienated from God. In Ephesians, he talks about they are dead in their trespasses and sin. Death means separation. They are alienated. They are separated from God. But you know what? Man didn't, man didn't make the way. God initiated the way. We were separated from a holy God. He created everything and it was good. And He created man and it was good. And he gave him one order, do not eat from the tree of the, uh, um, knowledge and truth. And he said, don't eat from that tree. And Adam and Eve did. They disobeyed. And we looked at that, that verse uh, the other week that by sin entered, by one man sin entered in the world, then death by sin. We, were, we all are sinners. But the good news is that Jesus came to forgive us of our sins. He came to forgive us of all our sins on the cross. That's the reason that Jesus came. He says there, the world is ignorant. Ignorant. <clears throat> alienated. They're alienated God through their ignorance. Ignorance means without knowledge. Without knowledge. Why is the world ignorant of God? If you wonder, you say, why are they? They're without knowledge of God. One simple reason. Because they reject Him. They're ignorant of God and the things of God is because they reject Him. Look, at, look with me to Romans chapter 1. We referred to it. Let's go, let's go back there. Romans chapter 1. And let's look, start at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth of unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things, for, uh, things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead. So they are without, what? Excuse. They are without excuse because 
that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. He says that when they... <clears throat> God, through re revealed through creation, reveals that there's a Creator, and because they not, did not reveal Him as Creator, did not honor God, did not go after God, they were ignorant. Why? Because of their vain imagine because they went after their own thought process they just said you know what i know better than god there's there's no way that happened they don't want to have any absolute truth when it comes to eternity but they live in a world that they say that they they want absolute truth i use that il illustration uh about going to the bank people say well there's no absolutes there's no no definites you go to the bank and deposit a thousand dollars and the bank then puts a, a $2 in your bank account, are you going to say something? You're going to say, I gave you 1000 They say, oh, well, we're going to give you $2 of the 1000 No, it's absolute. I gave you a check for 1000 I want $1,000 <coughs> in my bank. It's an absolute. It, it, is, it was a $1,000 check. I get the $1,000 for it. But because of sin, the world is separated from God. The world is ignorant of the things of God. What does it say? Uh, John says, John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the con uh, condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest the deeds should be reproved. Why do people not come to the light? Why? Because their deeds are evil. And why do they not want to come to the light? Why don't they want to hear what God has to say? Because they love their deeds. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to, 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 to go a different direction. That's what Paul was dealing with. He says, remember, that is what you've come out of. Those are the people that are around you. And, and it's so uh, appetizing to the flesh. It, it's so uh, appealing to the flesh. You're, you're trying to live differently as a Christian, and the world around you, the devil knows how he can lure Christians away. He can't take away your salvation, but he can move you out of a place where you're not being a, a light, where you're not being a, uh, an ambassador for the Lord. So he says, out of their ignorance, because of their ignorance, they do not follow after God. And they're the ignorance because they reject God, because they love their, their, their flesh and the things of their flesh more. Verse 18 and 19, next, the world is hard and callous to sin. Verse 18, understand being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to the work of uncleanness with greediness. They say they rejected God uh, and they, their heart has become hard to the things of God. Paul says that in 1 Timothy chapter 4 about false teachers. It says that this, they came and they abandoned their faith. Why, they follow, why do people follow after these false teachers? Because they become liars and their consciences have been seared as with a hot iron and they fall after people that are going to tell them things that make them feel good and they're not going into the Word of God. False teachers. They, they get around, enough godliness around them, enough of the Word of God, and then they draw people away because they don't want to call sin, sin. <clears throat> Think about all the things that are around us, what the advertisers use. Think about today the things that have been redefined as okay. They're trying to redefine marriage, redefine this, and reclassify this sin and that sin. The Word of God isn't changing. God's not reclassifying. So if you want to go to the direction and say, well, it's okay because my friends are doing it. It's okay because this person says so. It's still wrong in the eyes of God, and we still got to answer to God. You realize this? When we stand before God, we're not going to be there with our friends. We're not going to be there with our family. We individually stand before a holy God, and we've got to give an answer before God. And he's saying here to, to these Christians, he says, remember what you came from. The world is against you. And, we, and Paul knew that there, there can be lured in. They, the Paul knows that the devil is going to use these avenues. They're in a culture that's saturated with sin. 
And it reminds us of our culture today. It's so easily accessible. It's even accepted today. And it was in their day. And Paul's saying, hey, don't go that way. Remember the folly. Remember the foolishness. Know their ignorance that they, uh, they are living in. And in verse 19, he says they're greedy for their sin. Their, their uncontrolled lust for, for more. That's what he says there. Their lasciviousness and their uncleanness with greediness. Their lust for more. This statistic may, is, is surprising. They say pornography makes more money than the NFL, NBA, and the MLB combined. All professional sports combined. What have we done? We've made a business out of sin. And, and that's what they were doing. That's the society that Paul was in. And Paul is saying, believers, you must live differently. He's saying, don't get sucked back in. Don't go that direction. This is what Christ has saved you from. We need to be reminded that that was us. As he said in Corinthians, that that was us. And in times past, that was our, our lifestyle. But we've got to remind it that we're not living for here and now. We're living for eternity. Why must believers be different? Look what Paul says, verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that you've heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. We be different because we know Christ. We must be eager learners of Christ. He says that you have learned Him. Remember when young Samuel heard God speak to him, Eli, the high priest, told him, Speak to the Lord, for your servant is listening. He told him, Samuel, this is what you tell the Lord when you hear him speak. Speak, because your servant is listening. What is he saying? I'm ready to learn, Lord, what you have for me. As believers, we've got to be ready to hear what God has for us. God, what do you got for me today? Lord, what do you have in your word today? And, and it's exciting. I don't know if you open your Bible and you get excited to see, uh, man, the times that he's talking about, the, the life that uh, these believers were living in. They were in this big city and they were in this crowd and all the sin was around them. And Paul's encouraging them. He says, hey, live differently. There's a better cause. Don't fall to the, to the flesh. He says, you've got to be learners. Continue to learn of Christ. Remember, we said two weeks ago that, you know, Paul says, uh, basically, follow me as I follow Christ. Man, that's a tough order. Those are big shoes to fill, to be, to be able to say, as Paul said, hey, follow me, because I'm imitating Christ with my life. That's, what, that's the mindset that all the Christians should have is, you know what? My goal is to be like Christ. And on this side of eternity, we're not going to get there completely. But that will be our goal daily. And when we open the Word of God that we can learn, Lord, teach me something that I can apply to my life. Not only learners, but we need to be obedient. As James chapter 1 says, we're not to just merely listen to the Word. We're not to just listen to the Word because we're deceiving ourselves. If we just hear the Word of God, we're, being, we're deceiving ourselves if we don't do what it says. Knowledge puff us up. I know people that they, they know a lot of the Bible, but the Bible don't have much of them. They, they, they have a head knowledge of, of the Word of God, but their life does not, uh, is not impacted with the Word of God. Are we obedient learner? Or we just try to, to put in the time and say, oh, I read this, I, I came to church and I did this. Or are we saying, God, what do you have for me? How can I apply this into my life? Is Christ calling us to make some changes in our life that we become better students of His Word? Maybe we got to spend more time. Maybe it's nothing more than we're not spending enough time with Him. Maybe there's other stuff in our life that we've got to get out and say, you know what, Lord's not going to use a dirty vessel and He's putting something in your mind to say, hey, you got to get rid of that. Nothing like the Spirit of God to rid you of sin. I learned that early on. I had a, a co-worker that got saved and, and he came to, came to work and he said, man, I got rid of this and I stopped doing this and this and because the preacher said it. We saw it in, in Florida, in the church in Florida, people do things. But you know what? When you allow the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God from the Word of God makes application and conviction from God comes on a person's life, they don't struggle with it anymore. 
They can say, I'm freed of that sin. That's how we have drug addicts and people who are addicted to sinful behaviors that they can stand there and give testimony and say, I've been set free. Why? Because the Spirit of God convicted me of my sin by the Word of God preached to me, and I'm now set free of that in my life. And they were learners. Not just learners, they did the things of God that were taught to them. So believers must be different because they are new in Christ. Verse 22. You put off. He's using dre- uh, 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 a lesson here, terminology of getting dressed. Put off concerning the former conversation, your former life, the old man that is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. He says, put on and put off. You took off your former way of life. Hey, Christian, don't go back. Now, he makes a great case here. He's talking about the foolishness. He's called it vanity. He's talking about it's just nothing. It's emptiness. Remember, your life was emptiness. We're so tempted. Many Christians are so tempted to fall backwards because the lure of the lust of the flesh, and they don't want to stand on the Word of God. They don't want to be different. You know what? It's hard to stick out in the crowd. It's hard hard to be different at times. But Paul is reminding them, this is not just a social gathering. This is for eternity. God has bought you with a price, and it's okay to be different. You know, imagine this morning how many people got up this morning, and they're out doing, they're out fishing, they're out playing golf, they're out taking the walks, and they're doing their recreation. They're not giving a thought to the things of God this morning. And, and, and people are lured into that, oh, man, I, that's my day off, I can do that. No, God tells us to come in and not forsake the assembly of ourselves to gather, together. We want to honor God, not be like the world. Paul's saying, don't go back. That's, that was empty. That's vain uh, thinking there. He says, be different. He says, put off, take off those things. Believers are to put off their old self. Their old man refers to the way our sinful life before following Christ. You say, well, because you're a Christian, you, don't, you, never, have, uh, you never deal with sin anymore. No, all have sinned. But you know what? Our sin nature no longer has power over us. We have the power of the Spirit of God. We don't have to give in to our sin nature. We now live by the Spirit of God that is stronger. He that liveth in us is stronger than the world. The devil has no power over our life unless we let him in. If we're not feeding our spirit, if we're not trying to live for God, guess what? He's going to get in. He's going to, he's not going to possess, the devil's not going to possess us, but he's going to lure us away from the things of God. He doesn't want us to advance the gospel. He doesn't want us to, to live for God. He already knows his end. He knows where he's going to spend eternity. And it's hot, and he don't like it, and he don't want to be alone. He's trying to get as many to, to stay with him. John says that the, if you have the Son, the Son will set you free. You're free indeed. Paul wants to, the believers to understand their freedom. Remember their background. They were worshiping in the, in the, the temple of Diana. They, they had all these prostitutes and all the sexual lust, the lying, the selfishness, all these things that were around them. He said, you've been set free from that. Don't go back. Christ has set you free. Enjoy your freedom, but don't run back into your old behaviors. The believers got a new mind. Not only, he says, um, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have the mind of Christ. Romans chapter 12 uh, tells us to present our bodies a living sacrifice and renew our mind, that we renew our mind, our, our way of thinking. How do we re, re, uh, renew our minds? We did that mess, I did that message two weeks ago, and Philippians tells us to, to think on these things, the things that we put into our mind. The old computer thing, you put garbage in, garbage is going to come out. We need to saturate our mind with the things of God. We must reject ungodliness. We must flee from it. They, uh, Joseph is our greatest example. There is going to be temptations that come your way. You look at David, David sinned and fell into sin and he sinned with Bathsheba. Why? He did not flee from the temptation. 
But you have Joseph, who was sold into slavery. He becomes a leader of, of the servants in, in Potiphar's house, and, his, and Potiphar comes and, and makes advances to Joseph. And what does Joseph do? He sit there and say, you know, this is probably not a good idea. Let's weigh out the consequences. You know, maybe somebody else would do this. And, no, what did Joseph do? He fled. He got out of there. He hightailed it out of there. So she grabbed a hold of his coat, and he still got thrown into jail. And what does Joseph say? It was better to be obey. He was better for it. He was better that he, he followed after God. He was better uh, uh, the way God's plans for his life than if he would have chosen. So we need to reject the ungodly. We must think on the godly things. That's the Word of God. If you haven't heard anything all year long, it's been repeated and repeated and repeated. The value of the Word of God. The Word of God, we must treasure the Word of God. It's a living book. It, it transforms our lives. And Paul is reminding them, hey, get rid of this. That was the old way. That's the old, you are new creatures. And he said, put off these things and put on the mind of Christ. Put on our new self. We have new desires, new, new uh, way of thinking. As believers, we desire the Word of God and God's righteousness. Jesus said, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. As a church, as a body of believers, we ought to desire to see things that please God. We ought to, we ought to desire what God de desires. He, he's given the church the great commission to see people saved. We ought to be excited about opportunities that God gives us to be a witness for Him. We ought to be excited about discipleship opportunities. We ought to be excited about daily being conformed in the image of God. We should let the fruit of the Spirit rule in our life. We should allow that to be what we are. We should live out that in our life. We have to put off the old and put on the new. Paul tells these Christians, he says, hey, I want you to be different. I want you to be different. I want, God has a purpose and a plan for you. Don't go back into that way of thinking. You read that list, and, and you look at the vanity, the emptiness, and the, the lasciviousness, the greediness. Nobody desires that. But listen, if we're not feeding our mind on the right things, we're just one decision away of going back the wrong direction. God's saying, hey, press forward. In, in the darkness, in this day and hour, we need a church that is pressing forward. We need a people, a body of Christ that's willing to come up and stand and take a stand for the Word of God. We need to be in the world and we need to be witnesses in the world. But we, don't need, we need less of the world in, in us and more of Christ. Let's meditate on that for a moment as Peggy comes to play.